Hello, welcome back to FPL IQ. I'm Rob, FPL Hall. I'm joined by Teacher FPL. This preseason, we're going to go through every single Premier League team. We're going to give you predicted lineups, the play style and how we think they're going to set up, the strengths and weaknesses of every team in terms of football and FPL, and player picks. The best ones that we think from every team and the ones to avoid. Today, we're going to be looking at Arsenal. Lucien, thanks for joining me again. Welcome. How are you doing? Much for having you, Rob, and thank you all the viewers that have joined us for our very first video. No matter how long you have stayed, we are extremely, extremely grateful for whatever you have seen so far. And please keep following us. Rob, what are we doing today? So today we have the big guns, the gunners in Arsenal. So let's have a look at the predicted lineup. Ramsdale in goal, White at right back, Zinchenko at left back, Saliba and Gabriel as the two centre backs. Rice, new signing, about to be confirmed. I think it's pretty much set there in that CDM position. Erdegaard definitely in the starting lineup, but then that that third slot in midfield, I've got Partey or Vieira or Havertz potentially playing there. And then either wing, you've got Saka and Martinelli with Jesus or Havertz in that nine role, depending on where they're going to play Havertz. So 4-2-3-1, uh, what do you make of this lineup? comes down to how Arteta interprets Pep's philosophy going into the new season, isn't it? Because his 4-3-3 was so obvious, but so unstoppable last season that really we are looking at whether he will choose to improvise or whether he'll continue to stick with this game plan that has worked so well. I think the key underrated piece of his entire puzzle, Granit Xhaka, since he has left, it's a bit difficult to expect Declan Rice to play the exact same role, although I would love it if we could see Declan Rice bomb into the box down that left half space just to support Martinelli. That would be absolutely fantastic. But as it stands, Arsenal are technically unstoppable once Gabriel Jesus is fit because Jesus' drifts to the left side really enable either Saka on the right or Martinelli himself on the left side. There are so many runs that I don't think we have time to go into detail over here that really we are just looking at who the number nine enables. It could be Jesus, it could be Nketiah, it could be Kai Havertz. Well, at least we know now that Nketiah stays central, Jesus goes off to the left, and Kai Havertz tends to drift to the right side based on how he plays for Chelsea. So, does it benefit Odegaard, Saka, Martinelli, all three? I think, given their fixture schedule, it's probably wise to own as many of those three as possible, which is why I'm pretty sure the template has drifted towards what you've looked what you've set up since our last video. Yeah, it is a 4 2 3 1, but with Rice joining uh, and Shaka leaving, and, and it's just that third position that makes it unknown whether it's going to be the 4 3 3 or the 4 2 3 1. So if it's going to be maybe a, a, a more difficult game, it could be a 4 2 3 1 with Rice and Party. Uh, holding and Erdegaard in front, but maybe against a team they feel more comfortable attacking. It could be Rice holding with Erdegaard and Havertz as the more uh, attacking central midfielders. Um, so it's really sort of team dependent there. But I don't think there's a lot of people going to be disagreeing with um, most of this starting 11. I'm pretty confident, apart from that third midfield slot and potentially Hazus and Havertz swapping around we'll again we'll know more after preseason, but i think this is a pretty a good thing about arsenal is we're pretty sure most times what you're going to get uh, and what you're going to get is usually quality so we'll go straight into the strengths of arsenal we don't need to spend a long time to basically say they're a very good tar uh, very good team to target and they have excellent prices you know quality of attack the second for goals quality of defense third for goals conceded fourth for attempts on target third for clean sheets they are a reliable 11 with key fpl players that you know are going to start they've got good squad depth so if the left back zinchenko gets injured tierney comes in and it's not a, a very big drop in first 11 quality you know uh hazes is out havertz can go and play up front it there's not a huge problem martinelli's out smith Rowe comes in it feels like they've got uh players that can come in in any position and the quality of arsenal doesn't massively deteriorate strengths for arsenal anything you want to add to that it's hard to tell whether that's a strength nowadays because it just means that any of these players could come in. And for now, I find that their strengths are that their first choice is clearer than their understudy. At least we know that Zinchenko is slightly ahead of uh, Tierney. We know that the starting centre-back, Saliba and Gabriel, are definitely a lot more preferred than the likes of Holding. So 
while the first 11 remains fit, yes, Arsenal are definitely all about letting us choose between two attackers and one defender or two defenders and one attacker because the biggest mystery about Arsenal is not just about who scores the goals, it's about how many goals they score per game. They can be second best all season, but they actually fluctuate be- between being the top goal scorers in the league and somewhere mid-table because it really comes down to who starts in the number nine position. The people they set up, how their chances come about. We've seen desperate Arsenal wins that rely on them bringing on the likes of Reese Nelson at left wing when all else fails. Of course, they've got a lot more depth now. They have the likes of Leandro Trossard, who's basically a forgotten man at this point. So I, I'm really waiting with bated breath to see if they want to revolve their side around one to two players, or do they want to continue with this swashbuckling, unpredictable side? Because when all of them don't fire, Arsenal look very, very one-dimensional. If people block Saka off his left foot, and just prevent him from shooting from range, then he's forced to cut down to his right side. And when he when he's in form, he can cross for Martinelli no matter where Martinelli is. But when he's off form, then Saka's just stuck in a cul-de-sac. So really, it comes down to this term called hot pen fallacy. Whether you believe a player will score a goal and go on a streak, or whether he will just score once and look hot like a flash in a pan and it'll suddenly just burn out really depends on how Arsenal score their goals rather than who scores their goals. So in terms of weaknesses, I put none. I think Price is a fair, likely to be top four again. Adding Rice is only going to improve that midfield. You know, I think he's a step above Shaka. Um, great stats for attack, great stats for defence. You know most of the 11. I, I, I can't really pick a big hole in this Arsenal side. Um, anything that you can point out about the weaknesses? Weaknesses do not lie in Arsenal. The weaknesses lie in our ownership with Arsenal. Mm. <laughs> First and foremost, Arsenal's competitors are the 5.5 million Chelsea fullbacks as well as any starting Man City defender for 5 million. So really, would you rather own an Arsenal defender, a centre-back at 5 million, or would you rather own the likes of Kyle Walker, Ruben Diaz, or Emerick Laporte, given if he nails a starting spot? Secondly... At some point last season, the talking point of owning three Arsenal midfielders concurrently was very popular because all of them were £6.5 million. This time round, they all cost £2 million more, well, mm. except for Saka, of course, but they collectively cost about 3 to £4 million more. So will you employ the same strategy? Because the, this conversation is not new. We've had conversations about owning multiple £8 million midfielders since the likes of Madison and you know whoever Saka and there were plenty of 8 million di- midfielders already last season so we're going to have that same conversation but this time round if you own triple Arsenal attack would you rather have two midfielders and a forward would you rather own Bruno Fernandes <laughs> that, that talking point is going to be eternally going on and on while Arsenal continue to be healthy so that I find is their biggest weaknesses being spoiled for choice yeah I think I think that's a, a really valid point and it's one I mentioned or will mention in future video about uh, Pereira at Fulham you know you, you look at the value of Arsenal last season being worth like 6.5 million uh, uh and it was a joke, right? That's why everyone was triple. But now they're 8.5 million. And you've got the likes of Bruno Fernandes at 8.5, Son and, and Rashford at 9. Uh, it's it's making us make slightly more decisions. Um, but in terms of uh, them as a whole, I still think a triple up is pretty much essential. Uh, and I think most people are going two midfielders and one defender but but time will tell on that so let's go on to our picks i don't there's not gonna be any huge insight here my top pick is saka he's on penalties he's i can't believe he's 8.5 he should be 9 or 9.5 million he should be the most expensive arsenal player in my opinion um but the fact that he's the same as erdegaard and and you know pretty much the same as all around them puts tack tack penalties on there and and i think that makes him the clear number one choice at Arsenal. Uh, who's your number one pick? I can't even go into a top pick because all three mm. of their form forwards from last season really just take top three in no particular order. I think for me, it's more about who would excel in the opening eight game weeks while everyone else is settling themselves. Who can take advantage of the positional chaos that will 
basically appear in Arsenal's opening schedule because, as it stands, Martinelli is a winger who essentially plays striker. Bukayo Saka is a right wing that can shoot from range and has penalties, as you mentioned, while Odegaard, well, he's just an all-rounder superstar that doesn't even have to crash into the box to score a goal. I, I really can't tell. I, I just really just picked those three in no particular order and I'm really just thieving at my first draft that I even considered Gabriel Jesus in the first place. <laughs> Which is funny because I've Scratching brought me. him in. I've brought him in. And we'll talk about the ones that you think will be a trap. But we're in agreement, pretty much any of the midfielders. Martinelli, Saka, Erdegaard, take your pick. You can't really go wrong. right? If if you get Martinelli and Saka goes crazy, it, it, was, it was a close call, right? Uh, the only slight difference... Um, the first one is I'm going for Salibro over Gabriel. I see Gabriel making a lot of traction online. Uh, people saying he's more of an aerial threat. However, I just feel Saliba gets higher for bonus points. I think people are looking at the overall points. But Gabriel played 3,409 minutes and Saliba played 2,415. So I think the points difference and the bonus points difference as well shows Gabriel to be better. And I know people argue, oh, well, that means, you know, Gabriel plays more because Saliba got injured. But players that have a track record of being injured, like Wilson, they do it several times. Saliba's just got an injury and he missed some games. So I have Saliba ahead of Gabriel. He's just signed a long-term contract. as well. They're both now, they're both great choices. I just prefer Saliba. I think he, I think his potential for bonus points with clean sheets is higher than Gabriel's attacking potential from a, a set piece. Uh, but where we disagree, I have Hazes as my second pick. But we're going to go on to the traps now because one of the traps that you have said is the number nine position. For me, it's the Kai Harvard's effect. You shell out that much money, he has to feature somewhere. And Kai Havertz right now doesn't have a definite role in this Arsenal side. If Kai Havertz plays number nine, the whole dynamic changes, even from Odegaard's positioning, like he literally operates in Odegaard's best position. And that would affect his dynamics with Saka, with Martinelli. Like if Kai Havertz from the number nine drifts over and overloads the right half space, he works with Saka and Odegaard to set up Martinelli. So that's one possible scenario. Kai Havertz himself could be a number nine, a conventional number nine, because one of Kai Havertz's underrated strengths is that he's able to drift to the far post and win far post haters based on drifted crosses. This would be perfect for Ben White, because that is absolutely Ben White's specialty from right back, putting those floated crosses to the back so that Martinelli can finish. And that basically hampers Martinelli's output because Kai Havertz would be the one as first choice. I find that Arsenal's strengths in the opening season, Gabriel Martinelli aside, will be set pieces because when choosing between the back line, really for me, it's about how Arsenal scored their set piece goals. I think we've really let fly under the radar that Arsenal have a humongous set piece threat. Sometimes it's Martinelli, uh, sorry, sometimes it's Gabriel that benefits directly from corners. Sometimes they have very clever routines that involve short corners or at least capitalizing on the second phase of corners where they intentionally lose the first ball, let the ball land in a particular place, and then they have somebody score from the resulting rebound, so called. Zinchenko did it very well in the first half of last season. He was one of the biggest profiteers, like basically hanging on that space between the six yard box and the penalty boundary. And he just waits there. He knows that the corner is going to come in and Arsenal are not going to win the ball. But because it's an in swinger, it comes to him and he puts in that second cross for somebody else to score. So, really, I find that the number nine position could be a trap for now because literally everyone else will outscore him, at least in the opening stages. But that just goes to say that when Gabriel Jesus gets his traditional 17-pointer against some relegation-threatened side, we just have to not feel sore about it. That's all. Yeah, I, I have him. We talked about price points before in the first video preseason, and uh, 8 million is just a perfect one because he can go to pretty much any other forward that isn't Haaland. Um, so if you want to drop down to a 6.5 or 7.5, you, you, you're going to make a little bit of bank there. Um, so I think he's great to start the season with. Uh, we do agree that the fullbacks um, 
are a one to avoid. I have it because white is 5.5 million. So you, you said yourself, it could be a re really good thing, this system for white. But 5.5 million is too much for a more defensive. He's not a traditional wing back. He's more of a full back. Um, and Zinchenko could get injured or he could get replaced by Tierney uh, with, with uh, Champions League football coming up. Um, so I just think there's a bit of volatility and competition for those uh, fullback positions. Were you thinking along the same lines while you put that? That's the thing about Ben White. He doesn't behave like an attacking fullback. He doesn't behave like a super defensive centre-back, but he will somehow get assists. In fact, I think he got a goal just by playing wide, right? When Reese Nelson scored the winner. Yeah. I think the, the goal before that was basically Reese Nelson crossing from deep left midfield. And Ben White was the only one at the far post. So it's, it's a case of when you see somebody awkwardly playing a position that is not his best one, will he deliver? Or will he suffer from quote-unquote second season syndrome and basically not finish everything that he had last season? For me, I find that overperformances like these tend to not repeat themselves, and that's why I've labelled the fullbacks as traps. That being said, Zinchenko was only hampered by his minutes. At some point, Zinchenko was basically the central attacking midfielder of the entire side. <laughs> so, we'll see him pop up in that exact position mm -hmm. again, because he has been playing central attacking midfielder for Man City. So, it's just a matter of time. And we'll have the same debate again on whether fullbacks are traps. But for now, it's just there are just too many volatile factors yeah. to consider. Five million for someone who didn't score a hundred points uh, when there's so much value out there. I don't think it's particularly worth it. And just one last one from me is Ramsdale. Um, he's he's five million, and yeah, they get the clean sheets. But I just think the attacking options are so solid for Arsenal. Uh, all midfielders and Hazus, even though we disagree on that, but Hazus is still a popular choice. Plus one of the defenders for 5 million with the bonus points, I think is better. I always find, so he's sixth for clean sheets in a top two side, which isn't great. Um, I just think for big teams, if he's not getting the clean sheets, he's probably not getting the save points because they're a better team. And I think there's so many good 4.5 million options that I'd rather have like a mid-table side that occasionally gets a clean sheet but gets more saves than a team that might get a clean sheet but Ramsdale's probably not going to get uh, too many save points because Arsenal is such a, a strong team. Um, in terms of scoring Arsenal out of 10, I've given them a, a 9 out of 10 um, because that that's pretty much as high as I go. There's no team that's perfect. He said we can disagree on like Hazus and the fullbacks or whatever. But I think as an entire team for FPL, they're a 9 out of 10. Great fixtures, fantastic team. Would you give them a 10 or a 9? I, I would. No, I, I would easily give them a 10 because 10. You, you can just like close your eyes, throw a die at the board, and as long as the front force pictures are there, you just pick one and you just stick with them. And they'll be fine. Yeah. You can't, you can't get annoyed if you've chosen... Erdegaard, Martinelli, Saka or Jesus and they, they get something and the others don't or vice versa you didn't choose wrong can I, can I quote Gambler's policy before we move on to the next team yeah so Gambler's policy is where we you know if you're at a roulette table and black keeps coming up right most of us will tend to think that red will come up next but mm -hmm. we know that each thing each event is independent of the next one so if you own Martinelli and, Gab and, and Bukayo Saka scores last game, right? You reset everything and you ask yourself, will Martinelli score the next game? And the answer is most certainly yes. So really, as long as we don't fall foul to gambler's policy, trying to chase one bandwagon after the other, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. Yeah. And then the argument becomes whether or not it's form, right? But again, if Martinelli's playing well and he doesn't score, you stick with Martinelli. You don't only switch if he's not showing. And that's part of what our channel is about, right? And what our show is going to be about. It's not necessarily which player scores the most FPL points. It's did they do what we thought they would? Yes, the end product wasn't there, but the expected goals or the assists or the positioning or whatever we were targeting, they did their job. They were just unlucky not to get those points. And and that's basically what you're saying about, you know, if Martinelli isn't getting the goals, but he's getting, you know, the positioning and looking at the heat map and the attempts on target, but the goalkeeper's pulling off world-class saves, you've still made the right decision. So don't kick yourself about it. 
Thank you very much for watching today's video. Let us know in the comments below which three Arsenal players do you think you'll start the season with and who do you think is the best asset at Arsenal? Is it Saka on penalties? Is it Erdegaard as an all-round world-class player? Is it Martinelli because he's a little bit cheaper? Is it Gabriel Jesus because he's a forward? Let us know in the comments below. Thank you very much for watching today's video. As always, have a good one.